So in this video, I'll look at the introduction to human anatomy. So we're going to look at some of the concepts and some of the important terminologies to consider when embarking on the study of human anatomy. So we'll go direct into the definition of terms. So these are some of the important definitions that you must know. The first one being biology. So as you may be aware, biology is a science that deals with the study of all living organisms. So living organisms, these are organisms that have the ability to perform a special process known as metabolism. In addition to that, organisms have the ability to reproduce and pass on genes to the next offsprings. Human beings are biological beings. That's why, since anatomy studies the structure of living organisms, it's important to start with this definition. What is anatomy? So anatomy comes from a Greek word, which means anatom. So you will see that anatomy borrows a lot of nomenclature or words from Latin and Greek terminology because uh, these are some of the early, earliest star anatomies uh, come from that region in Europe. So ana means apart or upon, then tom means cut. So simply put, anatomy means to cut apart or to dissect so that you can study what lies beneath the surface and then try to establish the relationship that various body structures have with each other. That being said, anatomy is a branch of biology. It's also a branch of medicine that deals with study of structures, the human body and how they relate with each other. Apart from that, in anatomy, you're also going to learn some of the disorders that may affect various structures of the human body. Mm -hmm. So, when it comes to anatomy, we see that Andreas Vasilius is considered as the father of modern anatomy. So this is a man that was born in Belgium around this time. And then he did a lot of work in anatomy and published a book called The Fabric of the Human Body. And it reads like this in Greek. Uh, the Humani Corporis Fabrica Libri Septem. In English, simply, simply translates the fabric of the human body. So the first version was published in 1543, but he went on to publish more, so it has about seven volumes. Uh, this book is still important to date because it carries accurate descriptions of the human structures and how relate to each other. Apart from that, Vasilius used a very radical approach to studying anatomy, and uh, he revolutionized the study of dissection. This is where it involves cutting of the human body so that you can study various internal structures, rather than basing the anatomical knowledge on empirical observation. It's not enough to just study the body by observation, there must be a point where you see for yourself what lies inside the body. And Vasilius is one of the people that was a pioneer in this. Before Renaissance, most of the studies in anatomy were done empirically. People just used to make observations and then postulate what is happening inside the body. You learn physiology separately from anatomy, but uh, Jean Fanel was the first person to use physiology. Okay, he's the one that came up with the term physiology, but he's not considered as a father of physiology. Instead, Claude Bernard, a French, is considered as father of modern experimental physiology because of his work that he did. Okay, so those are the two founders or the people that contributed a lot to the growth of these two knowledge of 
uh, bodies of knowledge that are closely related anatomy and physiology are closely related that is structure and function so here we have a brief account of history so we say the oldest record about human beings trying to understand or describe the human body was found in Egypt and you know that Egypt is Africa right so we can say it's in Africa where we have the earliest recording of the study of anatomy which is a human body so this was somewhere around 500 years before Christ was born now these writings were found on special writing material known as papyruses so papyruses this is a plant more like a bamboo a very soft plant that is used so it is split to make more like a twig impasa for those that uh, use bamba so similar to that and then uh, people were writing information on such so such recordings uh, were found and it showed that people were trying to understand the human body other areas studies could have been conducted but there is no documentation therefore africa carries the earliest recording of anatomy apart from that we see that with time the method of studying the human body was undergoing various changes so there are various important figures starting with hippocrates hippocrates is a greek physician and is considered the father of medicine and we know that there is an oath that can be taken up, usually likened to Hippocrates himself. It's called the Hippocratic Oath, right? He was trying to come up with some form of declaration or oath that individuals that have the responsibility to look after human beings should take more like a pledge to promise not to do harm to human beings intentionally. Apart from that, uh, Hippocrates is, uh, is also immortalized in the sense that he came up with uh, four theories. He said, uh, uh, rather four humors. There is a humoral theory that he came up with based on various body secretion that can be seen so for example the first humor i considered was blood then there's flame or mucus then there's yellow and black bile so according to hippocrates you're saying when you see black bile it means a person has disease okay which you know is essentially just blood blood that has clotted turns black so most of these uh, theories were based on observation, so they were not so accurate, but still they were helpful in those days as people were trying to understand a disease and how to manage them and also understand the human body. So no dissections were done. All studies were based on observations. So equally, Hippocrates contributed a lot. So we have another individual by the name of Aristotle, which is a Greek, is a Greek philosopher and also was involved in other areas of study like zoology teaching and writing now aristotle is the first person to try to explain the special branch of anatomy called embryology embryology deals with the development of the human being okay from the two processes we have that is oogenesis and spermatogenesis development of the gametes up to the human being when the fertilization occurs, how does human being develop? So that branch of study is called embryology. Aristotle did a lot of work as well, but most of the things that he discovered was not named after him. So he was naming structures just by trying to get other words from other sources. So he never named any body structure after him. So he was the first person to name the iota. So iota, this is the largest artery we have in the body, and we use this term up to now. But in their studies, remember these were not doing any dissections. They, not, they never observed any internal structures. They were just doing external observations. So he thought that intelligence 
he is located in the heart and not the brain. So him thought the organ responsible for human intelligence is the heart and not the brain. Because at least at some point you can feel the heart. You know, when you are scared, the heart beats fast. When you're running, the heart beats, and so on and so forth. So they thought this is where human beings think from, not knowing that the brain controls all body activity. We have another individual by the name of Europhilus. So these are these individuals came in what we call the medieval age, all right? The earliest studies. So Hirophilus was a great teacher of anatomy in Alexandria and performed some dissections on living animals. So they would observe how blood used to flow in animals, like dogs, cats, and other wild animals that they would procure and you know do experiments on, but never did dissection on living human beings. That was against. The morals still up to now is against human rights to experiment on people like that. But during those days, uh, these early anatomists used to steal bodies from cemeteries or what we call graveyards. So when people bury the dead ones, they would send some young people that they would pay money to go and steal these bodies and then take them in the labs and study them. So this was a common practice in Europe and it created serious concern among the public. So these were called tomb raiders because they would invade tombs. People in Bari, when people bury, tomorrow you wake up, you find your person has disappeared and you don't know where they have gone. Not knowing that some people are studying on those bodies. And now, so that created serious confusion in the communities. So laws were also being applied to make sure that people study science in a normal way. Apart from that, Herophilus is the first person that discovered the ovum. This is a female gamut using a magnifying lens. And he named it ovum. So he was studying the products, of course, from uh, the product of menses. He was in inquisitive of what is in that product that usually happens every month in women. Then he discovered that there was a special cell in there and then he turned it over. Okay, now we have the Roman periods. So the Roman periods, this is a period after Christ. If you see all these individuals you have discussed, that is Herophilus, Aristotle, Hippocrates, these lived before Christ. Like Herophilus in this case, he lived 325 years before Christ was born. Right? Then in the Roman periods, we are now talking about years after Christ. For example, we have Galen here. Galen was born 332 years after Christ. So he's considered as the best physician since Hippocrates. So he's considered as a prince of physicians. Since Hippocrates is considered as a father now. We must take note here that um, he, Galen was given, you know, an unnecessary respect among his peers. This guy was intelligent. Most of them consider him as a genius, all right? So most of the things that he wrote in his books were based, again, on empirical observation. Uh, no dissections were done. But just because of the caliber of the person that was writing, most of the people were not willing to challenge him because he was a very good orator, a public speaker, a very good teacher, and an accomplished scientist. And most of the works that he did, people just considered it as the truth, even without proving whether it is true or not. So he found that his work was unchallenged for 1,500 years. So that's one century and a half. None of his books, articles, or so on and so forth were questioned by anyone. It was considered as a taboo to question what Galen says. So whatever Galen says is correct. But that's not true. Most of his you know, writings were not as accurate. People were, were not even just interested in going against him because even if you do that, people will not believe you. 
they will just say Galen said this and you're saying this. So you are, you are the one who is wrong. Galen is never wrong. So he theorized on so many medical subjects. He came up with so many theories in anatomy, physiology, pathology, and symptomatology. But most of them were challenged much, much later on. Okay. We have a period called medieval period. So this time is, you know, it's a time after the fall of the Roman Empire. Now, during that time, there was a lot of persecution of scientists because they are considered as a threat to authority. So most of the scientists were killed. If you're found studying about the human body, studying about society, mathematics, physics, and so on, these guys were targeted and were killed. So most of the scientists were never public. So they were studying underground, if I can put it that way. You're studying while hiding. So they created what we call secret societies. And this time, the remnants of those are things that you hear, like the Illuminati and such kind of things, where people have these, you know, conspiracy to say there are these cohorts and so on. The reason why these guys were studying underground is fear of death, because once you're caught, then you are gone. So for you to join their club, to join their schools, they have to strictly make sure that you are clean. You're not going there to spy on them and so on. So only a few people knew where they were meeting and were allowed to be part of them. So they are called secret societies or secret clubs. Not that they were satanists. No. It's because of that reason that I've explained. Now, during this time, none of the records, we don't have much records about the study of the human body because nothing was published because people were studying in hiding. Except for Ibn Ishaq. This must be an Indian uh, physician. Now, uh, this guy was trying to translate most of the written material into Arabic. Yeah, see, he's an Arabic physician. So he was translating from Greek into Arabic. Not that he was producing new material. No, he was just trying to translate those books so that they can be read in Arabic. So this is the only thing uh, recorded during this time. Otherwise, most of the studies were not published. After medieval, so it's called Dark Age in science. Medieval is also called Dark Age. Okay, this should be 16, if I'm not mistaken, it should be 16 to 17th century. This showed a lot of stagnation in science. Then we have Renaissance now. So Renaissance, yeah, I was mistaken. So the Dark Ages should be for 13th century, 12th to 13th century. There was nothing there. Now, Renaissance is from 14th to 16th century. So this one shows now a period of new birth of knowledge. So now people are interested in knowledge and persecution reduced. Yeah, people understood that, okay, science is important and it's an important part of life because we need proof and evidence for certain theories rather than believing just because someone has said it. So individuals that were so pronounced in this age, number one is Leonardo da Vinci. I'm sure you have heard of this individual born in 400, 100 and 1,452 years after Christ. So that's almost one and a half century after the birth, uh, the death of Christ, so after the death of Christ. So this is a, an Italian genius. Now, Leonardo da Vinci has done a lot of work in various fields, not just medicine. He's done a lot of work in engineering, music, architecture, painting. So like the guy was just all over. That time, you know, bodies of sciences were not established. So you can do anything you want. You can study physics, you can study maths. Tomorrow you're studying history. Tomorrow you're painting. So that's what da Vinci was doing. Da Vinci is one of the individuals that were the first to, to, to draw something that looks like a helicopter. He was trying to understand if at all such you know, inventions can work. So he's the first person to draw, I think, a helicopter. That was realized years later when he was, he was long gone. Equally, he did a lot of work in anatomy. He did a lot of dissections. Because this guy was an artist, an artist, he drew a lot of paintings of internal organs of the human body. And this was important because anatomy 
does not depend solely on description. Anatomy requires you to see the actual structure and appreciate it, touch it, feel it, so that you know. So learning anatomy requires you to use all those senses I've mentioned, touch, sight, hearing, if possible, even testing. So he was the first person to observe the moderator band of the right ventricle. So you observe there's a special structure in the right ventricle. I'll remind you of this when we start looking at the internal structure of the heart. It carries some of the bundles, bundle branches of the Purkinje fiber and the bundle of his. I'll remind you on that one. Next person is now Vasilius. So Vasilius, uh, you can see already came about 1,500 years after the death of Christ. Years and years after the death of Galen. Remember that Galen's work was not questioned for 1,500 1, years. It was not questioned until Vasilius came. Now, Vasilius did a lot of work in anatomy. And his work was after doing a lot of dissection. So he started writing books. And these books were going against what Galen wrote. Because Galen was just observing and assuming things, but rather Vasilius, Andreas Vasilius was dissecting. So a lot of people did not believe him. Now, what he started doing was to conduct what are called public lectures, where they would bring some bodies that have been preserved, and then he would compare what he wrote in his book and what Galen wrote, and then let people see for themselves. So if you say the heart is located here, and people can see that, that this is where, really where the heart is located. So people started accepting what this guy was doing until finally people generally accepted now that for us to accept any theory, it has to be proven by so many people. So that's why his work is considered as a revolution in the study of anatomy because it brought in the aspect of proof. If you say there are blood vessels in the body, then those blood vessels should be found even by other anatomists. If you say the heart is located in the chest, and then someone else finds the heart is located in the abdomen, who is saying the truth? So there must be witnesses, there must be accurate documentation, and that's what happens up to date. So this guy is the father of modern anatomy. Quite a short man, but very intelligent and dedicated to work. So he dissected a lot of human bodies and out of that made accurate observations which are still useful up to date. Other individuals, uh, William Harvey, is the one that suggested that we conduct experiments on the motion of the heart and blood in animals. Because previously the belief was that blood flows from the heart and then it goes into cells directly. The concept of blood vessels was not born yet. So this guy uh, emphasized that we need to conduct experiments to see how blood comes back to the heart. Okay. Now, these others, I can skip them. We have Malfiji. So Malfiji is considered as the father of histology. So histology is a branch of anatomy that deals with the study of the human body using microscopes. So he used a lot of magnifying lenses to observe structures that cannot be seen by eyes. For example, cells. You can't see cells with eyes. You need special instruments called, uh, called microscopes. Okay. Yeah, just hold on a minute. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right, so those are the individuals that are important in the history of human anatomy. There's still so much to learn about the human body, most especially the brain. So research must continue. All right, now let's look at some other terms that are important in anatomy. <clears throat> All right, so the next one we'll look at is anatomical position. So I'll use diagrams here 
for simplicity so that we can understand each other very well. These words you can read on your own, but I'll focus on describing what is in front of us. So these two specimens we have are the male specimen and the female specimen. Both of them are in anatomical position. So what is anatomical position? This is an assumed position. We imagine this position. So it helps us to describe the human body with ease because if all of us, maybe we're not in the same environment, but maybe we're communicating via telephones and other modes of communication. And then I'm trying to explain where this person has some injury or deformity or anything. We assume that a person is in this state called anatomical position. So what is it? Anatomical position has the following characteristics. First of all, the person must be standing upright or the human subject must be standing upright like these two. Number two is that the feet should be together. You can see that one. These two feet should be together. We can't see at the bottom there, but the knees and the ankles should be touching each other. Then the hands should be by the side of this person. Hands by the side. And then the palms should face forward. See that? Palms face forward. And then the thumb should be at 90 degrees angle from the rest of the fingers. So the thumb should be away. It should be like this. Like that. Not the way this is showing. So this one is not so accurate here. But the thumb should be at 90 degrees angle from the rest of the fingers. And then the face should be looking forward. You see that? The chin is up. The chin is up. Next, the eyes should be open, the mouth should be closed. The face should be neutral. This one, there should be no smile, no frown in the face. The person should just be neutral. And then the toes, there, and the feet, the toes should face forward. Then what you have at the end of the day is a person standing in anatomical position. So the legs should not be apart. The hands should be beside the body, face forward, neutral face, eyes open, mouth shut, palms facing forward, and toes facing forward. So this is an anatomical position. Now let's look at some planes. I'll go back to this diagram. So there are three important planes that will divide the body in half if the person is standing in anatomical position. Let's start with the first one known as sagittal or median plane. Sagittal or median plane is in blue here. Sagittal or median plane. So sagittal or median plane divides the body into two halves, a left and right half. It's this color here or this line. It cuts through the nose, through the chest in the sternum, through the umbilicus, and through the symphysis pubis here in the pelvis, so that you have one leg this side, the other on that side, one hand this side, the other on that side, one breast this side, the other on this side, one eye, one nose, one half of the mouth, and one ear on the other. So that is the median plane. Median because it's a middle line or sagittal plane. Another plane is a coronal plane. Now, coronal plane cuts the body into two halves, a part that is in front and a part that will be at the back. So the one in front, we'll call it the anterior part. The one at the back there, we'll call it the posterior part. So anterior in front, posterior back. That is the coronal plane. Now, these two planes I've described, sagittal and coronal planes. You can have a similar line, like the sagittal plane here, but maybe it doesn't cut through the center. Maybe it cuts slightly on the right. So we call such as a paraplane. So paraplanes are parallel to the normal plane, but they don't cut the body through the center. For example, you can have what you call the, uh, the median paraplane or the sagittal paraplane or the coronal, paracoronal plane, parasagittal plane. Para meaning is parallel to it, but it's not cutting through the center. So parasagittal plane, paracoronal plane. Now, the third plane, I'll talk about that, cuts the body in two, two halves, is called the horizontal plane. Here, demonstrated by purple or red. You see that? 
Now, this is called the transverse horizontal or simply axial plane. Now, the axial plane cuts the body at a specific point. Now, in, in front of our hip bone here, if you touch your hip bone, you feel some sharp bones here. We call those as the anterior superior iliac spines. Anterior superior iliac spines. So they are here. So this is where the plane cuts. So this plane, if it's cutting between the two anterior superior iliac spines, it is cutting at a level known as the arcuate line. So that is the arcuate line there. It's about halfway between the symphysis pubis and the umbilicus. So this plane divides the body into an upper half and the lower half. Upper half, lower half, or superior and inferior. So three major planes, sagittal plane, coronal plane, and horizontal or transverse plane. Very important planes because they divide the body in half. Other description, we'll look about terms of direction. Now, terms of direction help us to direct each other when we're trying to explain the human body. Number one is anterior and posterior. I already talked about this a bit. The first one is anterior, meaning something that lies in front of the body. Anterior, in front. So like this uh, human subject, we're looking at it from the front. So this is anterior view. If you're looking at the human subject from the back, that would be a posterior view. If you're looking at the human subject from the sides, this is a lateral view. So there are two lateral views. A, a right lateral view and the left lateral view okay so i've already explained this one anterior and posterior and then lateral the opposite of lateral is medial medial so medial means in the center lateral is away from the center so medial is here in the midline lateral is away from the center this is a center. If you move away from the center to the left, that is left lateral. If you move away from the center to the right, that becomes right lateral. Okay. Another example is ventral. Okay, so ventral and posterior are used the same. So anterior is also known as ventral. Posterior is also known as dorsal. So back is dorsal or posterior. Front is anterior or ventral proximal and distal superior and inferior i think i use the same diagrams proximal and distal proximal refers to closer to the point of attachment or closer to the central part of the body this is the main part of the body the neck the head the neck the chest the abdomen and the pelvis then we have attached structures to that, which we call limbs. Lower limbs, which are legs. Upper limbs, which are arms. So, the point of attachment of the upper limb is a shoulder here. All right? So, we can use proximal and distal in the following manner. Proximal meaning closer to the point of attachment. So, for example, this is the arm. This is a forearm. This is the arm. This is a forearm. So you can say that the arm is distal from the shoulder joint. We can also say the, for, the arm is actually proximal to the shoulder joint. Arm is proximal to the shoulder joint, whereas forearm is distal to the shoulder joint, meaning it's far away from the point of attachment. Okay. So proximal like proximity, closer, distal, distance, away. That's how you should remember them. So that was proximal and distal. Now we can look at superior and inferior. Superior means towards the head. The head is the most upper structure of the human body. Inferior, we are going towards the legs, towards the buttocks here. Okay, now, superior can also be replaced with 
cranial, cranial because head. Inferior can be replaced with caudal. Caudal in reference to the coccyx, the tail. The tail is somewhere there in between the buttocks. That's where the coccyx is. All right, now you, you realize that before the arms and so on are formed, the legs, before the legs are formed, before the arms are formed, the human being is just the central part that is available. The legs are not there. That's why we follow caudal as the most inferior part. Okay, not the legs. No. Because even when the fetus is in fetal position, the legs are folded, they'll be here. So the low, the most lower part of the body will be the buttocks. So that's why we say cranial, meaning superior, caudo meaning inferior. All right, so you can say, for example, the breasts are superior to the buttocks or superior to the knees, meaning they are above. Or the breasts are cranial to the knees, meaning the breasts are way up in compared to the knees in terms of position. Superficial and deep, so these are straightforward. Superficial is close to the surface, deep is located inside the body. There's another special term that we use in reference to the nose, rostro. So the nose is considered as the anterior most part of the body in the head. When you're talking about the head only, the nose is considered as being in front. So when you say rostro, you are talking about a body part of the head that is closer to the front. For example, the mouth is rostral to the ears, meaning the ears are located at the back, whereas the mouth is located in front. Okay, then ipsilateral and contralateral. Ipsilateral refers to body structures located on the same side. For example, the left arm, yeah, the right arm and the right leg, they are on the same side. They are both on the right side of the body. So they are ipsilateral. Contralateral means opposite side because this is a center. So for example, the right arm and the left arm, they are contralateral to each other. They are on the opposite side of the bodies. Internal and external is similar to superficial and deep. Internal, internal organs. External, on the surface. Bilateral and unilateral. For example, we have organs or structures of the human body that exist on both sides of the body. For example, no, the eyes, nose, hands, legs, and so on. But there are certain organs that are just one. They are unilateral. They are not paired. For example, the mouth is one. Mm, the productive organ is one. Uh, that is penis, vagina is one, never two. But if you talk about ovaries and testes, those are bilateral because they have a left and right ovary or testes. So those are some examples of unilateral organs. When it comes to positions, there are two important positions that you are aware by now, a supine and prone position. So supine in reference to the spine. So this is a human body lying on the back. Prone, human body lying on the abdomen. Then comes to surfaces. So we have two surfaces of the palm and the feet that are similar. All right. If you look in the palm, you see that the skin that is there is similar to the skin that you're going to find in the sole. So we call this as thick skin. Thick skin is hairless. You don't find hair in your palms. Neither do you find hair in your sole of the foot. Those are the areas of the body covered with thick skin because they are adapted for friction. Whereas on the back of the palm, you find thin skin. So thin skin is skin with hair. So whatever you see hair, just know that that is thin skin. Same with the top of our foot there. It has hair, so that is thin skin. So this is the palm surface of the Hand, and this is a dorsal surface of the palm. Palm surface, dorsal surface. Same with the foot. Now the foot has a plantar surface where we find the sole, and the dorsal surface, which is the top of our 
foot. Okay. Now the next uh, terms I want to talk about are terms of movement. Terms of movement. Okay. So let me cut this one. I'll continue in the next uh, session. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.